And three, two, one. Good to go. Okay, well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, um, whatever it is where you are. Um, time is weird. So my name's Amy. I'm currently in Perth, uh, which is in Western Australia. So it's sort of about four o'clock in the afternoon here for me. Thank you very much for, for joining in on my session today. So to start off, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and then today we're going to talk about doing front end testing. So I'm a freelance front end developer based in Perth, which means I spend most of my time at the beach and the rest of it working from home in my pajamas. So technically nothing should have changed for me right now, right? I am also heavily involved in the Perth tech community. I helped to run a user group, uh, the Perth Azure user group, and used to help run a user group for front-end developers. I'm also on the committee for DDD Perth, which is the largest tech conference in Perth, and attend pretty much all of the Perth tech meetups, as well as working as an evangelist for YAL conferences. Last year, I also became a Twilio champion and a Microsoft MVP. I also have a beautiful grey and white border collie who sits next to me whenever I'm working from home. And although he's enjoyed having me home, honestly, I think by now, after four months of me being here, he's really wanting to have some alone time and would like a bit of a break. But today, I'm here to talk about testing, specifically testing the front end of your application or website. Now, we all know that testing is important. That's never been a question. And although there's a lot of debate about whether you should write your code or your tests first, we even have a software process, test-driven development written, uh, centered around writing tests. But despite all these strong opinions, we often don't hear about what's happening on the front end. There are so many different tests that we need to be running on the front end. We've got accessibility testing, performance testing, user testing, HTML validation, visual regression testing, just to name a few. It's often hard to know where we need to start and what we should be testing for. So some of you may be thinking that, well, if I'm standing here talking about this today, then that must mean I'm an expert on testing, right? Last year, the the only testing I could do was running the Cypress script uh, with, that was already set up in an existing project. I knew pretty much nothing about front end testing other than the fact that obviously we should be doing it. I've only just gone through the process of learning about front end testing. I came in with no prior knowledge, uh, no, no testing background which means that I've already just been where, where you are today. So hopefully I'll be able to, to help you through this and uh, you'll be able to ideally get where I am now um, and to better understand how we're doing front end testing. So start off, I want to talk about linting. Now, although linting isn't technically testing, it does make our life a lot easier and makes the testing a bit easier to do down the track. For those who aren't familiar with it, uh, linting is automated checking for programmatic and stylistic errors. It's a type of automated check and it happens early on in development. It checks for and sometimes fixes small stylistic errors. Now, I'm going to talk about two tools for this, which is ESLint and StyleLint. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones depending on what programming languages you write, though. And these tools can both be run on the command line or depending on your IDE or deployment pipeline, you can run them through there. So starting off with ESLint, uh, nice and easy. We're going to install that with NPM. Um, which I have done ahead of time because I'm not going to try and do a video call while installing a node module um, on Australian internet. Um, so ESLint is something that we can integrate. We can then set up a ESLint RC file, which allows us to specify a bunch of different settings that we want to use in our project. 
Specifically, we're mostly looking at uh, extends, so extending existing config plugins, any plugins that we're using, and then rules, uh, any any additional rules or settings we want to use. Uh, so in this case, I'm using the Airbnb base settings, so that gives me a head start of a bunch of things I want. I'm not using any plugins because uh, I'm not really using anything in the project right now, but I've then also set a bunch of additional rules. Now, some of these rules may be things that the, the Airbnb base doesn't include already. Some of them may be me trying to override their rules. I then run this on the command line. Uh, so I've set up a NPM script and uh, it has failed, um, which obviously that has failed because I've got errors. Um, so I can go through and run this from the command line and I can have a look. This has then given me a printout of results for all of the errors that I've gotten from my ESLint test. Now, that's a lot of errors um, and this, this is often less of something that we want to run on a manual basis though, and linting is often something we try and do automatically through our IDE, which I'll, I'll go through doing that for style lint. Um, but from here, we can go through and we can have a look at a bunch of the results. Uh, so we can see examples from some of the errors that we're getting. For example, here we have an error for unexpected console statement. And if I have a look in the file, I can see there that that's because I've got a console log and part of my uh, my linting config is I don't want to have any console logs because it's something we should definitely be removing before we go to production. So this will help to catch all of these little things uh, and we can often auto fix a lot of them as well to make our life as developers easier. There are a bunch of different rules that uh, that we can set up in ESLint. There's a list of all of them on the website, but I'm not going to remotely go through all of them today because we don't have anywhere near enough time for that. Uh, similarly, we can also use StyleLint. StyleLint is uh, used, so ESLint is used for, for JavaScript. StyleLint is used for CSS and SAS linting. Uh, in this case, uh, I've set up StyleLint to use the VS Code extension to do it automatically. Again, I can set up a StyleLint RC file and can set up a bunch of things. So again, uh, I can define processes. Uh, so in this case, I'm doing SAS. So I want to let it know that I'm using SAS. Uh, I can also set up a um, pre-existing uh, oops, no, nope, I'm not using SAS as a processor. I'm using SAS as the syntax. Um, I'm not using any extends, but I have predefined a bunch of rules to use. So I'm going to set them all up in my StyleLint RC file. Then, because I'm using the VS Code extension, I can go through and I can have a look as I'm typing and as I'm writing my code, I can get it to go through and automatically check for and potentially fix some errors. For example, I have one setting which says that I want a maximum of one empty line between statements and if I add extras, that's now highlighted in the output that, um, first of all, that I have unexpected white space because it's been tabbed in, but also that I have more than one empty line, which these errors will disappear when I fix it. So this is a good thing to have set up to make sure that not only the other developers in your team uh, are writing code the same way, but also that uh, past you is writing code the same way as future you. Similarly to ESLint, StyleLint also has a bunch of different rules where you can go through and have a look at what you would like to set up for your particular project. So that's a couple of examples of linting and how we can set that up. Next, I want to have a look at accessibility testing. Now, accessibility testing covers a wide range of different things. It can be validating HTML. It can be checking for alternative text on images, looking at color contrast, uh, looking at the way things will appear with screen readers and reader modes, 
And this this is actually something that's super useful because it means if if our content and our websites are accessible by somebody using a screen reader, they're also accessible by other sorts of assistive technology like a Google Home and Voice Assistant. So this is something where we get a win-win. Everybody benefits from accessibility testing. Now, most Excel accessibility tests will test against the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines or WCAG, uh, which is a predefined set of principles set up by the Web, the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative. It's a lot of acronyms for you there. Uh, so this is predefined set of guidelines uh, around the particular standards that we want for accessibility with our websites. Currently, we're looking at WCAG 2.0 and 2.1 as the current standards, but you can also find the previous standards. Now, for accessibility testing, I like to use a tool called Pally. Uh, I like this one because it was easy to use. I can run it on the command line. It's open source and it has a bunch of different options. So I use the command line interface but they also have Pali CI, which is a tool that we can, um, it's more geared towards integrating with uh, with your pipelines, so your CI CD pipelines. It also has a dashboard to allow you to track accessibility issues uh, on a regular basis. So this may be something that any non-technical people in your team would like to have a look to show how your sites perform and how you're improving over time. So this is a cool one to check out. Because I'm using the command line interface, I'm going to go ahead and run npm install Pally, and then we're going to set up to write a test. Now, Pally doesn't require uh, a specific language. Um, it does work on a lot of different languages. However, the tests are written in JavaScript. Uh, so hopefully you'll be a little bit familiar with this. So I'm setting up a JavaScript file in my project to go through and write the test. Now to do that, the first thing I'm doing is I'm going to require the Pally package. I then gonna set up a function where I'm going to do a promise and inside that promise, I'm gonna run the Pally function. And I, for now, I'm just gonna pass in my, my URL of the website. And at the end, I want to log out the results. At the end of my file, I wanna run the function so that I can just go through and run this JavaScript file through my command line. Now, uh, if anybody is using uh, WSL on their computer, there's WSL1, not WSL2. Uh, there's a little hack that you have to put in as well. Um, so Pally uses Puppeteer to do its browser testing. So we need to require that and set up some custom browser config details to let it know where it can find the Windows version of our browser. Uh, so I'm gonna define the browser settings at the start of my function. And then once, once I've let it know where it can find Chrome, I want to pass in those, those browser settings to the options section on the Pally function so that I can run this on my computer. So this bit is just a hack for if you are using WSL1 as well. Once I've set this all up, I'm then gonna go through and run my test on the command line. Um, sometime soon. Here we go. I'm going to run the test on the command line. So I can do this by just using um, using Node to run my JavaScript file, which I've placed inside the test folder in my project. And now it takes a while to go through and run. Cool. Running, running. There we go. Um, so here we go. It's now given me a bunch of results, which is great because it's console logged out a bunch of objects. So I can see that I have a bunch of objects and I can do nothing with that just yet. So the next thing I want to do is I want to be able to read these results a bit better. So I'm also going to require the file system package. This will allow me to save those results out to a file in my project so I can access them a bit easier than reading them on the console. Now, instead of using console log,
Instead of using console log, I'm now going to write those out to a test uh, result file and I'm going to JSON stringify the results and save that out to a JSON file so that I can easily access them in future. So that's inside my test folder. I'm going to create a results folder and then save my results in pally.json. Um, and then I'm going to go through and clean some of my code up because ESLint, because I've set up linting, has been yelling at me uh, about having this set up properly. So now I'm going to go through and run this again. Now when I go through and run the test, it shouldn't log this out to the console, but it should generate a file with the results for me. Testing. And now I can see the results. And if I go through and have a look here, um, so here I've listed out, um, this is listed out all of the results that I've gotten back from my accessibility test. Now this is just using Pally the way it's set up without any additional configuration. So out of the box, it is testing for a variety of different WCAG principles, which is the accessibility guidelines. So I can then go through and have a look at one of the errors and look further at this one. So for each issue, it gives me a bunch of different details, code, message, uh, various different types of things. But these are the items that I specifically want to have a look at. So here we have code, particular code of the error, the type uh, and the type code, as this is an error, message, the context and the selector. Now, the first thing I want to do is I want to have a look at the context and the selector. This will allow me to see where on my page this error has come from. So the context will let me know the specific element. So this is telling me it's come from an image element and the selector will let me know where I can find that, that element. So HTML body header image, which if I go through and have a look in my browser's dev tools, I can find that the image inside of the header. So that's the that's the background image I've got on the header there. So I know that that's where my error is coming from. Now, if I have a look back at the error again, at this time I want to specifically look at the code and the message. So that error message it's given me, it says the image element is missing an alt attribute. Use the alt attribute to specify a short text alternative. Now, in this case, it makes a bit of sense. Um, my image doesn't have an alternative text and <coughs> my image doesn't have an alternative text and I need to give it one. But if I need more information, I can also have a look at the code, specifically, uh, specifically the last section of my code here. A uh, bunch of numbers and letters. And what this is, is this, this is the, this is the specific WCAG guideline that it's got issues with. I can then go to uh, this website, which lists all of the WCAG guidelines. And on here, I can search for that specific code that I've got an error with and find where it is on the page. And so here, I can find the specific criteria it's got issues with and how I can go through where it's come from and how I can go through to fix that. So that's really useful for going through and finding more information. Now, as I said, we were just using Pally out of the box. There are a bunch of other things that we can do with it. Similar to other testing tools, we can get it to do actions, so we can get it to click on things, we can get it wait for things, that kind of thing. We can set up specific viewport size, so we can test on various different uh, device sizes, uh, setting the width and height, and whether or not this is a mobile. We can also set the specific WCAG standards. So out of the box, it will test against WCAG 2.0 AA standard, uh, which is fairly standard for accessibility testing. But if we needed to uh, comply with a more advanced accessibility standard, we can also get tests against their triple A standards, which is often something that governments have to meet. Depending on what you're doing, you can also pass in uh, different methods 
and headers and data to the request as well if there's something that you you need to pass or if you're if you're doing something a little bit more advanced you can set that in so what I want to go through and do now is I want to set up a few additional options for my test. This time I want to test against the AAA standards, so I want to make sure my blog is super duper accessible. Uh, and I also want to save a screen capture so I can get this to go through and save a screen capture when it's running the test. So when it loads the browser in Puppeteer, in Puppeteer I can get it to save a screenshot of what is going on. Now this can be super useful because Puppeteer might render it differently to how I see it in the browser. So I might get a particular error that doesn't make a lot of sense for me and so I can have a look at the screenshot to see what it's looking at. So here I've got a screenshot that's rendered out and if we have a look at it a little bit closer we can see that my web page isn't really loading the way I expect it to. There's a bunch of images cut off. There's a bunch of text that doesn't appear. There's not images where there should be. Something definitely isn't going right. Uh, so this is really useful to see exactly what it is that we're looking at and work out what's going on from there. You may have also noticed that when I've set up the test, uh, I set it up in a promise.all. So this allows me to easily go through and run multiple tests in the same function. For example, I can run against my homepage, I can run against a specific blog post, that kind of thing. So now if I go through, I can grab the URL of one of my blog posts to test against that, paste that in, and then edit the name of the screen capture so that I know where this has come from. I can then copy and paste this test um, or write another one from scratch and I can then test out the home page as well um, and in this case I've also set up the viewport uh, so I've set up a custom viewport so it will test against the mobile screen size but I also want to test against the desktop screen size as well so there I've got two tests running for the home page of my blog one at a mobile screen size and one at a desktop screen size so I can test them now I can go through and run the, the one file and this should run tests against those three different pages, the blog post, the home page at mobile and the desktop, the home page at desktop size. Cool. Now when that's gone through and run, I can then go through and have a look at my results and I've got a bunch more screenshots in there now of the various different page tests. And when I have a look at my JSON file with the results and format it so that I can actually read it properly, uh, I can see that I now have uh, three separate tests with issues inside of each different test. So I can go through and get all this data in in one go. Now, depending on what you're wanting to do, you may choose to. Uh, so I, I like to keep these these results files logged in Git because I find that's really useful to then keep track of what issues I've resolved and improvements over time. But a lot of people prefer not to do that as well. So it's up to you whether or not you want to keep these results. So. That's one example of accessibility testing. Next, I want to talk about visual regression testing. So visual regression testing, a uh, bit similar to Git, it looks at the difference between old and new, but in this case, it's looking at visuals. So pixel for pixel, what is different from last time? Now, this takes, this does visual regression testing by taking screenshots of an app compares old to new and is the visual equivalent of git diffs. For this, <coughs> for this I'm using a tool called backstop.js um, mostly because it was recommended to me and it was super easy to get set up. But there's a bunch of other options that you can use. Now to do that, this time I'm going to install it globally because backstop has a really good function for setting up new projects. So I'm going to install this globally so I can do it easily. Then inside of my project, I'm going to run backstop init command. Now this is super useful because this will actually set up 
a backstop config file uh, inside my project. So a lot of this is all set up, ready to go. Uh, similar to in Pali, this uses Puppeteer, so I want to give it a uh, the correct path to where it can find Chrome because, because I'm using WSL. And I also want to go through and change. So by default, they'll set up a scenario to let you know what you can do, but they set it up using their homepage. So I want to replace this with information about my my browser. So my my website that that's what I'm testing against. So I'm going to go through and set it up to test against my website. Nice and easy to run. I now go through and run backstop test. This will go through and load my web page um, and take a screenshot. And it will go through running tests and it's let me know that it's failed. My tests have failed. That's no good. Now, if I wait for it to properly finish, I can have a look at what's going on. So inside of the backstop data folder that it also generates in my project, I can have a look. They've generated a HTML report for me. I can have a look here. My tests have failed because it didn't have a reference image, so it tried to compare non-existing image to the new image it just took. So that makes sense that it would fail because it didn't have anything to reference again. So I can go through and run a command backstop approve, which lets backstop know that the screenshots that it's just taken are the reference screenshots that it should be using. So it's copied those to become the new reference screenshots. I then run backstop test again, and this should then go through and take new screenshots and compare them to the screenshots that I've just told it is the new reference screenshots. And it runs the test. Uh, now, similar to other testing tools, uh, you can also give it uh, like different cookie files and different headers and information. So if there's anything uh, more advanced that you need to do with your tests, you can set that up inside the backstop config file. And of course, the second test is taking way longer. Cool. And it's run the test. Run the test. Um, and now it's let me know that both of the tests have passed. So now if I open up my report again and open that in the browser, I would expect to see all of my tests have passed now because um, I will nothing's changed. So I do expect this to be the case. So I can go through and see my reference screenshot, my test screenshot, and it's not showing me uh, a visual difference because there is no difference. These are all identical screenshots. Now, although visual regression testing can be good, it is comparing pixel for pixel, and so it can yield false results. Uh, it can yield failures uh, when it actually might be okay. For example, your images may not have loaded in just yet. Uh, for example, here's a screenshot of a test that I ran on my blog, and you can see in purple where it's highlighting the differences between the two tests. Now, most of these have come from images not quite being loaded in properly, but it's highlighted that there is a difference. Now, there is one setting that we can change to make this a bit easier. So uh, there is an option to set a mismatch threshold, so the percentage of different pixels to allow while the test still passes. So have a look and play around with that value to, to set the threshold to what works for you. So, what have we managed to go through so far today? We've had a look at linting. We've got that set up. We've looked at accessibility testing and we've got that set up and we've looked at visual regression testing to make sure that nothing in our code changes unless we want it to. Now, this is pretty awesome, right? Uh, but there, this is just a short session and I've only managed to graze the top of this. So what else can you have a look at? 
Uh, so there was a really great talk at NDC London last year by Jennifer Wadella, uh, which goes more in depth with using using Pally to do to do accessibility testing. So you can have a look at that. Uh, last year, I also wrote a blog post on front end testing, which looks at a bunch of other different tools and a few testing concepts. And uh, earlier this year, I wrote a, another blog post on getting started with front end testing, which goes a bit more in depth into some of the tests that we've looked at today, as well as using um, doing some UI testing that you can have a look at. Um, you can also find uh, links to my slides. Uh, uh, they are available online if you would like to have a look at these after. Thank you very much to everybody who came along to my session today. Uh, it's been exciting to get to share more about front end testing with all of you wherever you are. I, I believe we've got some people from all over Australia and India and Europe. So it's exciting to be able to share this with all of you from from my office here in Perth. Uh, I think I've got a bit of time left for questions. So if anybody had any more questions, if you want to pop it in the, uh, I believe Nadia, the Q&A is the best place to go for questions. Yes, please. Um, and so while some questions come through, because none have come through at the moment, yeah. I might just do a quick update to everyone on the events that we have up and coming at the Reactor. So I'm just going to share my screen quickly, Amy. Yep. And in this time as well, if you've got any questions for Amy, feel free to pop them in the Q&A. So thank you for all for joining us this evening or morning or afternoon, wherever you are. If you want to find out some more information about the upcoming events that we do have, you can follow us on meetup.com slash Microsoft Reactor Sydney. Um, you can also see quite a few of our global events as well if you follow our Twitter page. Um, all sessions will be recorded as well and they do get uploaded to our YouTube channel within the next few days, so keep an eye out for that. I will also pop it in our Meetup page as well, so it's easy for you to access. If you've got any questions about the Microsoft Reactor, about the content that we run, or if you're interested in taking part in these sessions, you can feel free to send us an email at reactorset at microsoft.com. Uh, there's a couple of sessions that we do have coming up next week. I've got a session on Azure reliability and resilience. So this session will explore what and how both Azure and our customers can work together in a partnership. We've got Azure DevOps and API. So this session will show you how Azure API and service hooks enable integration of your own third party apps into Azure repo pull request life cycles to provide insight into code changes and to add some value. So that'll be a really cool session. And we have another one called Build Quick and Easy AI Solutions Using Power Platform in an Hour. So in an hour, you'll go through some solutions and steps on how to implement AI solutions using Power Apps and Power Virtual Agents. There are quite a few prerequisites for that just to get familiar with Power Platform and to set up an account if you do want to go ahead and follow the presenter for that session. If you do have feedback on the session that we ran today, um, I'll pop the link in the Q&A chat. You can you can add it into aka.ms slash reactor slash survey with the event code 8051. And we just need that so we know which session you were talking about. Um, and I don't think any questions have come through. Amy, you must have answered everyone's questions during your presentation. Um, That's always good to hear. Oh, we got a really nice comment. So thanks, they loved this. And that was from Helen. So thank you, Helen. We're glad that you enjoyed the session. Um, so yeah, I'll pop those links in the chat. Oh, hang on, got another one come through. Oh, here we go. Got a question from Isaac. Does the front end framework you you work with affect the testing outlined here? Uh, to an extent, uh, but not not too much with what I went through today. Um, so the the application that I was testing was pretty much just static HTML. Uh, so so no frameworks were used um, in the creation of this application. Um, the the testing tools that I went through for the most part were were language agnostic. So the one the ones that weren't uh, were the linting tools. So ES lint is for JavaScript and style lint is for CSS or SAS. However, there would be linting tools depending on the framework or the language that you're writing in. 
Pally uh, runs uh, runs separately to to your application. So that one, um, although although the Pally tests are written in JavaScript, you can run that against an application in any language or framework you like. Uh, and the same with backstop. Um, so the config was in JSON, but you can run that against anything you like. You can run those against live applications as well as developer applications as well. Awesome. So I think that's, that was the only question that we had for tonight. Um, so thank you everyone again for joining. We will pop the recording up on YouTube in the next couple of days. Um, so thank you again and thank you so much, Amy, for joining us this evening or your afternoon and taking us through some front end testing. Um, so everyone enjoy the rest of your day and we will see you next time. Bye. No worries. Thanks for having me.